Well, if you have your Bibles open to 1 John chapter number 3. 1 John chapter number 3 tonight, if you would please. As we continue on in our, our study and looking at the book of 1 John. And uh, man, the roads cleared up well today, did they not? And uh, Michigan, we got out there and we drove and look at that. And, uh, you know, any major accidents? Not that I'm, I haven't heard of any major accidents out here among the church people, which is a blessing. And uh, boy, glad, glad you're here, excited for all that. I've been asked or mentioned that they noticed that I shaved my, my facial hair off. Anybody notice that okay? And I have a, a, a plethora and a multiplicity of, of comments. I wouldn't call them compliments, uh, comments. And I appreciate your willingness to comment on my well being and, and my looks. It really, it touches my heart. And um, boy, uh, from the, wow, you look different, I don't like that, to, oh, you look younger, and things like that. And, and then why did you do that? Well, I did it because my, my, my little daughter, she said, Daddy, will you make your face smooth? And so I shaved it for her, and then, uh, don't worry, I won't shave tomorrow, and by Wednesday we'll be all set again. So don't worry about that. And to all you haters out there who think I now look like 12 years old again, um, I can do one thing and look young. What can you do? But that's just... <laughs> <clears throat> that's that's terrible. That's terrible. That is terrible. But you got to keep it real sometimes. Uh, <laughs> no, no, no. Just uh, First John chapter number three. That's where I digress on that. First John chapter three. You don't forget in the service we'll talk about the wise gifts from wise men in the bulletin this morning. Uh, those things, handouts, you can look to invite three neighbors, three friends or co-workers, three relatives and strangers. We really like to challenge us as a church family to go out and, and think about who we ought to, who we should invite for our Christmas musical and Christmas events. And uh, there are people out there who want the truth and want to come to a great church and believe it or not, they don't know about First Baptist Church. I think that was shown during the trunk retreat when we asked almost if not every group how many it was the first time on the property at first baptist church and by our loose estimation about half had never been on the property of first baptist church before around a thousand people never been on the property here all right our job's not done yet now Praise the Lord for what he's done for us so far here in Saginaw, Michigan, for faithfulness at 44 years in this church and just the soul winning and the drive, but, but we can't put it in neutral yet. All right? We drop it down and let's put the pedal to the metal and uh, we'll invite some folks and see what God can do. And I know what he wants to do. He wants to save people and touch them with the gospel and transform their lives. And he'll use us. He'll use us. All right? He doesn't rent a plane and paint in the sky. He uses people. He uses saved people, ambassadors, and that's you, your job, and that's my job. And so we'll talk about that toward the end. Don't get me off track now. First John chapter 3, verse number 1, where John continues on. We looked at this briefly or two weeks ago, the beginning, the first couple words. Let's look at verses 1, 2, and 3, where the Bible says, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us. I'll pause there real quick. We, I will not re-preach the message, but I challenge us to stop and comprehend that word behold. To sit yourself down and bask in the love of God. We get busy. It's 2019, almost 2020. We have cell phones. Instant access to news. Instant access to every other person on the face of the planet who when they call, they expect you to answer their phone just like when you call, you expect them to answer your phone call as well. We're busy, 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 busy. And John challenges us to just behold, to take in God's love. To let it just wash over you, to be in awe and admiration, to comprehend it, to stop for a moment and put aside the daily burdens and the daily hardships and all the things that pile on top of us and just, just sit and rest in the love of God. It is now, I believe, the third major theme in the book of John. He will now continue this theme on and, and hit it from now until the end of the book, this love. He'll come back to it. He'll bounce away from it, come back to it. We come back to it. Remind yourself, listen, John wants us to live in the reality of God's love. If we're here, we've most likely been touched by God's love. So he says, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Don't be surprised when you're operating on a different wavelength than someone who's not saved. 
Don't be surprised when you view things differently. Don't be disappointed when the decisions, decisions that you make for your family, like Joshua, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Don't be surprised when they're not understood by those who have never tasted of the gospel. Because John says, he's referencing what Jesus said, the world doesn't know you, but it didn't know me, and I'm the creator of the universe. So don't be surprised that even though you're the sons of God, God, you're not recognized. Because in, in some way, shape, or form, you're incognito until you tell people who you are and what you're about. The problem is we have too many Christians who are not known by the world as Christians and don't do anything about that. Never open their mouths to share the gospel, never pass out a gospel track, never invite their neighbors. They, they prefer to remain uh, uh, anonymous. John goes on in verse number two, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Don't forget that Jesus Christ is coming back. He will appear. There are those uh, that would tell us that when the Bible talks about these things, uh, they already have happened and we're now living in the millennial reign. Okay? I do not believe that to be true at all. I, I have a different Bible interpretation, I think, supported clearly from Scripture that we're waiting for the appearing of Jesus Christ. He will come in the clouds. The dead in Christ shall rise first, and those which are alive and remain shall meet him in the air and shall forever be with the Lord. At that moment, we get a transformed body. If it happens tonight, my beard will grow right back out. Transformed body. No, I don't know what that, I don't know what happened with that. But I do know that that moment that the sin that dwells in this mortal body, in your mortal body, will no longer be present. Death has no sting and grave no victory. And though, though we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Verse number three, and every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Lord, thank you for this passage. Thank you for your love. Lord, would you move us, change us, and touch us tonight? Lord, as we look at your word, would you guide me as I speak? Lord, I have notes and tried to do my best and diligent in studying, Lord. But I need you to help guide and direct my thoughts and plans tonight. Lord, if there's something in here that, that I should not speak on or emphasize, I pray that you would guide me. Lord, help us as we listen to your spirit through your word, that you would touch us. May our hearts be turned towards you. Lord, thank you again for your love and the love of Jesus. In Jesus' name I ask, amen. We'll start tonight that the love of God ought to produce a response to, to God. The love of God for me ought to produce a response to God from me. Love always in our life always produces some type of response. For instance, there are those that would say, I love football. Not of me, but of themselves. I love football. Well, what response do they have? Well, they typically have a favorite team if they love football. First some it is the Detroit Lions. I am a Detroit Lion fan myself, and like a real Detroit Lion fan, I have fans of two teams, the Lions and a team that wins. A true fan. There are those that say, well, I love cheesecake. If you love cheesecake, there's really only one response you have in life, that's to buy new clothes at FedEx after you consume all the cheesecake. I love going to the Cheesecake Factory. How many have been there before? It's, it's almost not even godly. All right, it's that good. All right, and, and, and the way they set it up, I've, I've been multiple times, a few times now, to the one in Novi. You walk in the doors, and there's an entrance inside the mall, but normally you go through the entrance that is outside, and of course as you walk in, right there to your right is a display case of the cheesecakes. Now the cheesecake that I get on my plate never looks like the one it seems like in the case. All right, the one I get on my plate sometimes looks like it was sat on, right? Okay, like at McDonald's, same thing happens, all right? But man, those in the case, you look at them, and, and here's the hardest decision. Which one to buy? Oh, no, no. Which three to buy? Not which one. Man, love for cheesecake produces a response. Love for our children produces a response. 
When dads love their kids, they, they spend more, they, they stay up late perhaps, they drive, they shave. There's love for children. Christmas is coming and, and many parents will, will help get their kids some presents for Christmas. And, and you'll look and you'll shop and maybe even some of you ladies were out shopping on Black Friday. And if you were, that's okay, the altar's open at the end, you can come confess your sins. How about love for a spouse, love for my wife, love for a husband? That produce a response. Tonight, I want to look at, first of all, the relationship that we have. In these verses, I see, not only after we look at God and uh, the love of God, I see the quality of, of the love of God. It says, behold, what manner of love. But then he goes on to the relationship that we should be called the sons of God. I want to pause for just a moment on that and, and help us understand that once we recognized and accepted the love of God through the gospel of Jesus, we are now called the sons of God. Not called like a name, but we are branded. We are named with a new name. We now are the sons of God. All right, I had a different father. I have a new father. My pedigree is a son of God. Sometimes a, a dad or, or a mom will say, well, that's not the way a howl acts. Fill in your own last name there. Don't compare them to my kids, all right? Remember your own kids. And what, what does they mean by that? They mean that, well, in our family, that's not what we do. And every family has certain little idiosyncrasies, perhaps. Certain little ways that, that things are done in their house. And I mean, on every, on every holiday, there's certain traditions. This is just what we do. Why? Because that's what we do. All right? Is it right? Of course it is. That's what we do. All right? And, and uh, that's the way the Howells do it. It may not be the way the Robinsons do it, and, and definitely not the way the Goldsworthys do it for sure, but, uh, you know, it's the way the Howells do it. You're right there, sorry, John. You know, just can't help it. And we could bring that across the, the, the gambit till we look at Christians, and the fact is we ought to say sometimes that's not, not the way a Christian acts. Doesn't it seem sometimes like, like Christians that we work with are, are sometimes not even a poor representation, but the worst representation? Come on now, help me here. Sometimes it seems like you, you, you work with a, maybe a Christian businessman at times, and it's like, boy, I expected better out of you. Now, we're blessed with some phenomenal Christian businessmen in our church. Okay, but I've experienced some not in this church who brought shame and reproach to the name of Jesus Christ, to be quite frank. All right, who, who acted in such a way that, that it seemed like not even an unsafe person would act this way. I, I thought about a time growing up, my dad and I were painting houses. My dad was, uh, we did some houses on the side like that. And uh, I remember a time we worked for a Christian builder and, and his words were, well, I'll take good care of you. It was probably the worst we were ever treated as a contractor and painting contractor. I would have been probably 7th, 8th grade. I still remember the paint color in the house. Just those things that lock in your mind. And I still remember uh, this man and his, his poor testimony, and he was a Christian. And yet it, it seems, unfortunately, that there are those times that we interact with unsafe people, and they have, unfortunately, more character in the way they act than, than some Christians. Don't forget that we are called the sons of God. That means when you're at the grocery store, you're representing Jesus Christ. Right. You have a big old tag on you. You are a son of God. When you're at Walmart, you're representing Jesus Christ. I don't care if it's Black Friday or not, and they cut you in line. All right, it's crazy out there. It's crazy. I remember years ago a story I heard. And someone there used to go to church here, and, and someone cut them off. They're telling me this. They said they cut me off in line. I think it was Target. And so one of our church members years ago, former church member, need this lady. It was a man, grown man, need this lady to knock her out of the way. I mean, I guess if the deal is good enough, you got to do what you got to do, right? No, of course not. We are called the sons of God. Our pedigree is different. Sometimes people are hurt by Christians. And they carry that to the Father. They say, yeah, but, but at that church, that Christian, I think it was... Gandhi, who said, I would be a Christian except it were for Christians. Thankfully, I know a lot of Christians who that's not the case with. But let it be a reminder to you and to myself that we are called the sons of God. May we not forget our pedigree, our name, our branding, if I may, that we're ambassadors. And everything we do represents our Father and His love. I see the pedigree, but I see the promise as well. 
The promise that it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Verse number two. The promise that we are not what we will be. Those creaks, those moans, those groans, we are not what we will be. Those struggles, those heartaches, those hurts, we are not what we will be. We will be like he is. An amazing promise, not just potential, but amazing promise. A few years back, McDonald's came out with another burger. It's years ago now, called the Arch Deluxe. The Arch Deluxe, when it was marketed, they spent, I believe, over $100 million marketing this burger. Supposed to be a gourmet burger experience at McDonald's. I don't remember how old I was when it came out, but I remember the Arch Deluxe. I had a couple of Arch Deluxes. The funny thing is, it tasted about the same as every other McDonald's hamburger. Comes in the same kind of wrapping, and, and now they've got some signature series, and they taste about the same. It's, it's McDonald's. What do you expect? And it seems like I get snookered by those things sometimes. I'm like, this will be delicious. This will be good. And then I get it. And it's what I expected it to be. It's McDonald's. Sorry, children, I know you love McDonald's. How do they get inside little children's heads so early? I mean, not, my kids now are, are 11, 9, and 6, almost 7, Danielle. And, 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 but for years, where do your kids want to go? McDonald's. You can't even say daddy yet, and you can say McDonald's. What's wrong with you, child? I don't know what they do. Subliminal messaging. Jimmy Dean sausage. I like breakfast sausage. They came out with a product a few years back, pancake and sausage combined. Now, I am not one of the, don't say amen, Bradley. I am not one of those people who eat pancakes and sausage at the same time. I don't like big griddles, okay? Pancakes and sausage, this is not me. But they wrapped this thing up like a corn dog, apparently. <laughs> and they made the pancakes chocolate chip pancakes. Yeah, this, this is not a good thing. Thankfully, they have pulled this from the shelves. But man, I looked at the box when I was studying for the sermon and saw that, that advertisement, and it's a beautiful looking box with a beautiful looking picture. I can only imagine what that atrocity tasted like when you ate it. Chocolate chip pre-packaged pancake with sausage on the inside corn dog. Someone should have been fired that night. Okay, who thought that was a good idea? fact is we've probably all bought products we thought this will be life-changing this is what I needed and you get it and it's a disappointment Can I just tell you something when we see Jesus when we receive that new body and it's transformed to be just like his the Bible tells us there will be zero disappointment there will be zero misadvertising, all right? They're not, they're not overselling this concept. We will be like him, for we shall see him as he is. There's a promise there. It absolutely will happen. A pedigree, a promise, and there's the potential. See, becoming like Jesus Christ isn't something that could be, but something that will be. Becoming like Jesus Christ isn't something that could be, but something that will be. This is not just for the, quote, good Christians in the room. It's not just for the Apostle Paul or Peter or the disciples. It is for you and for me and for every single Christian, every single one who has named the name of Christ, who has asked for his forgiveness, they now receive this tremendous promise, this potential that will happen. I get to be like Jesus Christ. Go back to the first word of chapter 3, verse 1. Behold. A relationship ought to make us stop and say, thank you. Like we mentioned this morning, an attitude of gratitude. Lord, thank you. Thank you that you let me hear the gospel. Thank you that you, that, that you allowed me the, the chance to, to accept you as my Savior. Lord, thank you for your patience with me. For all my mistakes, boy, I tell you what, it's easy to look at someone else's mistakes and to get after them while I excuse my own. I mean, my, my struggles, they're hard. Yours are easy to get over, but mine are hard. Thank you for his Lord's patience. I was reading this morning 
my devotions. I believe it's the book of Malachi where I was at, where I found this verse. It talked about how the Lord never changes, and they talked about his compassion for not consuming Judah, Israel. And I was reminded this morning that because of God's unchangeableness or immutability, because God doesn't change, what was emphasized in the Bible was his mercy. Of all the things that the Bible could emphasize when it talked about God not changing, it could talk about his faithfulness, it could talk about his patience, it could talk about his purity and his holiness, but it talked about his mercy. And I'm so glad we're down in my devotions this morning. God, I'm thank you for your mercy in my life. I don't mean like collecting with my family, but I'm talking about J.D. Howell, my life right here for his mercy. And this right here, this promise is about his mercy. We shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. So we have the love of God, the quality and the, the manner of it. We have the relationship. But last, I see in this passage of verse number three, the response. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Well, i got to begin tonight. Every particular love produces a response. My question tonight is, what response has God's love produced in your life? You know, for some, it's a response of continuing. The response of, well, you know what? God loves me, therefore I can fill in the blank. I can live like I want to live. There's a movement out there called the grace movement. In this movement, it, because of God's grace, which I absolutely believe in God's grace, it's taught in the Bible, but I, it, what they translate it, it, what they interpret it as, to, to mean is that I can live however I want to live. In fact, someone told me in this movement, they said, listen, uh, the Holy Spirit led me to stay home from church on a Wednesday night. Now, there could have been something that led you to stay home, but it wasn't the Holy Spirit, Okay? It was another spirit, okay? Maybe your own spirit. There are sometimes, if I'm going to go down that road, the Holy Spirit leads me to stay in bed. I'll take that right there. Because my bed's a wonderful place. My pillow, best pillow on, the, on this planet. Come on now. I don't blame the Holy Spirit on that. There ought to be a, a response. Sometimes the response is to continue. Never the correct response to continue. I'll just live like I want, but I have God's love. And God loves me so much. Let, let God have a smile, a love smile on you today. Someone else said, let God hug you with a grace hug. Don't even know what that means. And here John says, there is a response. It is not to continue, but first of all, it is to cleanse. The response is to cleanse. That's what verse number three says. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he, that is God, is pure. He says, after you stop and look at this love, after you recognize what God has done and see the manner of it, the quality of it, after you see the relationship that, that you now have, your response ought to be to purify yourself, to get clean. First Peter, Peter says this, seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit unto the unfeigned love of the brethren. See that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. James 4, 8, draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. The problem is we believe we now do things and that shows love for God. Don't let me get ahead of myself, but the next point is to comply. First one is to cleanse. If we're not careful, we, we will lock into this mindset that the things I do now just show my love for God. I don't show my love for God by the things I do. I don't read my Bible to show God how much I love Him. I read my Bible to know my God. And because I love Him, because He loved me. All right? I, I, don't, I don't come to church so that everyone knows I love God. I'm here Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night, and even on Tuesdays when it's on Tuesdays. I don't try to demonstrate my love by my outward actions. The Bible says here what you do here in order to demonstrate your love, respond to your love, is to purify yourself, to be cleansed. This word cleanse here, it has the idea that we can't even cleanse ourselves. We can't do it. It's the washing of the water by the word. It's the Holy Spirit that cleanses us. We cleanse. We're supposed to comply. 1 John 5, verse 3, that it's the love of God that we keep His commandments. And His commandments are not grievous. 
There are those who will, who will level the charge that as independent, fundamental Baptists, we have way too many rules. I don't know what, I've never found that rule book for independent, fundamental Baptists. If you find it, send it to me. Now, what they mean by that is there are definitely different, maybe sometimes expectations. Different things that we teach, that the Bible teaches about. We believe that some things are wrong, right? We're okay to say some things are sinful according to God's Word. So we shouldn't do that. Beyond that, we think some things are helpful in life and some things are hindrances in life. But John says, if you really love God, this is love for God, you keep His commandments. Do what He says. How about when He says, love one another? He's talking about right here, love one another. Through this auditorium, we love one another. How do we do that? By praying. By seeking first the kingdom of God, His righteousness. I don't serve out of a fear of retribution. I serve out of a heart of gratitude. Often we act or serve out of consequences. Uh Uh-oh, God will get me, but we ought to serve out of love. We've all had God's mercy. We'll have it again. For years, for 12 years, was a principal at Bridgeport Baptist Academy, right? Now Pastor Galdamez is doing a great job as principal. Appreciate him doing that. And the teacher's phenomenal staff here. Throughout the, my time as principal, though, I, I was able to show mercy on multiple occasions. The Bible says that mercy rejoices against judgment. There would be times that there would be students who would be in trouble. They'd make wrong choices. Now, I don't remember. If, if there are students here, I, I don't remember all the times you're in trouble. I, probably if you asked me, I could remember one or two, okay? But the Lord helped me just wash that stuff away. You know, and, and, but, but able to, to help and, and to show mercy because that's what God does for you and for me. And the Bible says mercy rejoices against judgment. So when someone responds to mercy, judgment doesn't follow. Mercy follows. Judgment follows when mercy is ignored. In my life and your life, we've been shown mercy because of the love of God. Have we responded to the mercy or have we ignored the mercy? I want my kids to do right because of love. I want them to do right because they love mom and dad, because they love God. If they don't, they still have to do right. But I wonder what has God's love produced in your life? Three last statements and I'll be finished tonight. First of all this, God's love keeps me confident because I'm a child of God. God's love keeps me confident because I'm a child of God. You know who my dad is? He's bigger than your dad. He's richer than your dad. He's stronger than your dad. And if there's a problem, I'll call my dad. My heavenly father. But the Bible says I can call Abba father. So I don't use dad irreverently. In fact, most people say, scholars say that word means daddy. I'll call him. He'll come. He said because... uh, he, he, because he says he'll never leave me nor forsake me. That's my dad. So go ahead and pick on me. My Bible says vengeance is mine. Say it to the Lord, I will repay. So do what you want. God's got this taken care of. I don't have to fight any battles. God will fight them for me. I have confidence because of my father. God's love keeps me confident. I can live tomorrow. Why? Because I'm a child of God. I can face whatever comes tomorrow. Why? I'm a child of God. My God spoke the world into existence. He said, let there be light. And there was light. I'm confident. I'm a child of God. Not only this, God's love keeps me content. God loves keeps me content. What else do I need? Oh, I'll tell you, I got a whole Amazon list. What else do I need? You know what? Nothing. Nothing. That's why you can look at Stephen, the first martyr, and he can be stoned to death and still have a peace and calmness because God's love keeps me content. The problem you have, God's love keeps you content. Lastly, God's love keeps me clean. I want to be pure because God is pure. And I'm bringing tonight a glass. It's got a little mud on it. It's 
It's not very clean. But it's a glass. Is it not? And if you were coming to my house as my guest, I would not bring this glass out. You're a guest. I would not say, hey, good nut. Well, Brother John, maybe I would. <laughs> no. Of course I wouldn't. I, I would do what? Help me here. I'd wash it. I'd wash it. Why? Because you're my guest. And oh, I may not love you like my wife. Amen. <laughs> Care about you. I'm not going to give you a dirty vessel. Help me here. And yet, Christ comes, Ephesians chapter 5, that he might sanctify it and cleanse it by the washing of water by the word. He takes that word and he just cleans us up, right? And he gets us all clean. He who became sin for us, right? So that we could be clean. See, what does God's love produce in your life? Every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. I'm not trying to be pure for you. I'm not even trying to be purer than you are. The comparison game. I'm not as bad as... And pick somebody. We we'll always pick somebody who's struggling. We we'll always pick somebody who has some problems. Never pick a great saint, do we? We'll always pick somebody else who obviously is down the road we look in our view. I'm not as bad as them. But if I purify myself even as he is pure, every time I look away, I'm like, wow, I'm a mess. Wow, I'm a mess. John says, God's love challenges us to be pure for him. What has God's love done in your life? Lord, I thank you for your word. Lord, I pray you'd help us to listen to your Holy Spirit. Lord, perhaps there's someone here tonight who, though they have experienced your love and salvation, they have not responded the right way to your love. Lord, may our hearts be turned towards you. Lord, may we examine our hearts and our lives in light of your love and your word. Lord, we walk away realizing what a wretch, sinful people we are. In just a moment, we'll stand to our feet and the instruments will play. And I wonder if tonight you need to do some business with God. Maybe you've taken the love of God for granted. Maybe your response to the love of God has been less than appropriate. Maybe you've kept the vessel dirty. And God's love calls us to be pure. Lord, would you guide this invitation? May we listen to your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.